tonight. We're talking about parables uh, and stories are, are parables or stories. And so I want to begin tonight with a story. And the story goes like this. In 2009, this is not a happy story, by the way. Uh, in 2009, a woman named Ann Williams admitted to uh, taking, to embezzling $350,000 from her employer. It was a large family-owned company that she had been hired uh, to uh, serve as their office manager. You know, it started like it always does. It was a desperate need for her son. She needed some money for her son, and so she took a little bit at first, uh, but it was so easy. You know, it was so easy that she continued to take money from this company for years. And, uh, and at first, all the funds were really used by her for friends and family who were, uh, who were suffering with financial hardships. And she actually thrived on the appreciation that was offered to her uh, by these people that she helped. But, you know, over time, those monies started to go towards things that she wanted, her clothing and, uh, and some fancy nights out. And, uh, and she knew it was wrong. Uh, she, she, she told herself, you know, this is, this is wrong, but somehow she was able to justify uh, what she was doing by telling herself that, you know, the owners of this company are off in a far place on their boat having a good time, and besides that, they've, they've really got enough money already. And so she, she continued, and, and this went on undetected for years and years. In fact, she, uh, she explains that she really didn't think she would ever get caught. But ultimately, she was discovered, and, uh, and she was arrested. Uh, she went to court, and uh, she was convicted, and ended up spending two years in a penitentiary, and then two more years uh, on probation. And when she's asked about this experience, she says, you know, the hardest thing about it, the hardest thing was seeing the look of hurt and betrayal in her owner's face as she, uh, as she was sentenced. That was the, the most difficult thing for her to deal with. And you know, the problem with Anne was that even though she was hired as a manager, she was treating the money, she was treating the resources as if she was the owner. And uh, she had been given this great responsibility to look after uh, the business of the owner, uh, to look after his finances, and, and yet, uh, and yet she had, had uh, and started treating it as if she, in fact, was the owner. And this is a simple story. I, you know, I told you it wasn't a great story. It's not a great bedtime story, but it, it was a, this is a story, and it has a, it has a wonderful point to it, doesn't it? It's got a great lesson. And what is the lesson? Well, the lesson is that, that managers like Anne have responsibilities while owners have rights. And the problem here was that Anne, even though she was a manager, started thinking of herself as an owner. And simple stories can be very effective, can't they? They can be very effective as a means of communicating simple truths. And Jesus was a master storyteller. He used parables, and this is what our new study is all about, is just looking at some of the parables that Jesus taught. He uses parables effectively to, to point out important spiritual lessons to those who would listen. At the heart of our greatest hardships in life is a strong desire to act like owners of what God has given us instead of managers. And this is the lesson that we found in our study tonight. And it's a question of authority. Do we see ourselves as managers of God's good things, God's gifts to us, or do we start to think of ourselves as owners? Well, Jesus had begun this week, if you read uh, chapter 19, as sort of a, uh, to give you some context, you would have found that Jesus had begun this week with a triumphant uh, entry into the city of Jerusalem. And you would have also seen that the people, uh, as he approached the city, gathered along the roadside and they put out their cloaks and they put out palm branches and, and tree branches uh, on, the, on the road in front of him to make way. And, and, and the whole time they were shouting, Blessed be the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And so there was this fanfare. There was something. It was a huge, huge thing. And, and the leaders started to grumble. They, you know, they, what in the world? And they even chastised him and said, uh, you know, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about what they're saying? Later that week, or later, he goes to the temple. And when he goes into the temple, you remember he got to the temple and he, he, uh, he causes great chaos, mayhem, uh, by throwing out the merchants and the, and the money changers and kicking over their tables. 
Well, all this time, the anger of the leaders, the, the uh, religious leaders, had been heating up. And now it was coming uh, to a boiling point. In fact, the rest of the week they spent planning on a way to get rid of Jesus. So the week that began so wonderfully is now turning into something that, uh, of, uh, confrontational. And we find this, um, this little group of leaders uh, coming up to Jesus. Uh, you can almost see them. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty ominous looking group that comes up to Jesus as he's in the temple now. He's in the temple courts teaching and preaching the gospel. And, and they come up to him. This idea of coming up uh, is one of, there's, a, it's, there's an aggressive nature to it. They come up to Jesus and they confront him and they say, you know, they demand to know who has given you the authority to do these things? You know, what, what gives you the right to mess with the furniture in the house? And, and, and what gives you the right to, uh, to, to disturb our business? And then they say, you know, by what authority do you preach in this temple? Essentially what they're saying is, Jesus, who do you think you are? Well, Jesus, uh, as you know, doesn't answer their question, but he actually turns the tables on them and he asks them a question. He says, look, was the baptism of John from heaven or was it from men? Now, the baptism of John was something very new and different. There were, there were many types of ritual washings that took place, uh, and, and they all had to do with the way the priests uh, worked in and out of the, of the, of the uh, temple. It was, all, it was all wrapped up in temple worship. Uh, but this was a different kind of baptism. This, uh, this new baptism that, that, jo that John was doing was very new. He wasn't a priest, and, and all of his baptisms took place outside of the temple. And so Jesus is asking them, he says, look, this new baptism, is it from God or is it from men? Now, this was a bit of a stump for them. I mean, they, 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 they thought, well, if we answer from God, he's going to ask us, why didn't we believe? And if we say that if it was, for, it was from men, then the people are going to stone us. And, and, and so they're thinking, we don't want to be stoned. They had more fear of men than they did of God. And so they chose not to answer at all. And so Jesus says, well, I'm not going to answer either. Notice there's not a third, there's not a third option here. It's, it, it's either from man or it's from God. No third options. And Jesus was saying, look, the authority either comes from God or it comes from men. We're either trying to please God by obeying His commandments, by obeying His work, listening to His revealed uh, um, truth and responding to it, or we're left trying to please men. And with one of those questions, Jesus is able to expose their dishonesty and their true motives. See, they weren't really looking for an answer to their question, were they? They weren't looking for an answer. They were really just trying to uh, find a way to, to trap Jesus. But what had happened with this one question, Jesus had, had stepped out of the, the trap, and they had stepped into the trap. Did you see that? And so now they're kind of trapped, and, and now Jesus reveals the duplicity uh, for everyone who's around, all the people that have been within earshot of this, uh, listen to Jesus as he gives this story. He tells this story. Before we, uh, we go look at the story, I want to give you a little bit of background, though. In the first century in Palestine, um, these large estates that produced wine were, were very common. And, and the idea of an absentee owner was not uh, uncommon. Uh, so uh, there were these huge estates that needed people to work, and these uh, owners who had gone off somewhere else, perhaps they had other properties that they were managing or they lived in some other location, and so they would hire these tenant farmers to come and take care of the vineyard. They would provide the care and, and the upkeep of the vineyard to ensure a, uh, a, a uh, productive harvest. The work was labor-intensive. You know, in fact, it took up to five years before the plants that they had planted would even start to produce grapes, the fruit. And, and then at harvest time, the owner then would see, would, would send a, a servant to that vineyard, to the tenant farmer, and collect up to half of the produce, half of the produce. Now, if you've been working that hard and your plants are fairly young and they're not producing a lot, uh, you still have to give half to the owner. That's his rightful due, right? 
And so, uh, so there was always, there were, there, conflict in this scenario was not uncommon either. Uh, and so that's sort of the background, that's the cultural background here. But this story would also have immediate uh, attention-grabbing headlines. If, you know, as, as Jesus started to tell this story, the religious leaders and anyone who was familiar with their scripture would have said, hey, I've heard this story before. You see, this story is also found in Isaiah 5. You saw that in your notes uh, this past week, and perhaps you read uh, Isaiah 5 as a background. I think it was some of it was actually in your notes, and you saw some of the details from that. But it provides some important clues that helps us to unlock the meaning behind the story. So I'm going to read it. You don't have to turn there, but Isaiah 5 begins as a love song from God. It says, uh, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. Okay, so it starts out as a love song. This is a love song. God is singing. He's, he's talking about his love for, for, uh, for his beloved. Out of the love, he dug and cleared the land. So the, these... These vineyards would be built on a hillside. We just talked about the fertile hillside, but it's a very rocky part of the world. And so if you're going to dig up the land, you have, first of all, you have to do it by hand. Uh, it, it's not, you can't plow it, one, because it's on a hill, but also because you don't want to get rid of all the rocks. You need some of the materials to stay in the soil. But the big rocks you had to get rid of. So it's very labor intensive. You get rid of the rocks. It says he dug and cleared the land. He put a wall around the vineyard. So this wall would keep out the little foxes and, and marauders and people that would come to destroy the vineyard. So he put a wall around. He planted choice vines, the choicest of the vines he put in his vineyard. Uh, he built a watchtower uh, to keep watch and, and, uh, and he carved out a wine press out of solid stone. So th all the work that has gone into this vineyard has been done out of love. It it's something that he's done with, with great love and affection. And so he's provided everything needed now for a bountiful harvest. But when it came time for the owner to come and, and, and check on the grapes at harvest, he found that they had all gone wild. All of them had gone wild. In place of this pleasant planting, it says, he discovered disobedience and bloodshed. And then we go on to find in verse 7 that, uh, that the vineyard actually represents the nation of Israel who God had brought out of Egypt and had planted in a promised land. Isaiah 5 is, this, is a beautiful story, isn't it, of the goodness of God towards His chosen people. He's provided everything that they possibly needed. And, and, and note the thoroughness. Note the thoroughness of the goodness of God that's on display here. He, he prepared. Look at all these, these verbs. He prepared. He dug. He planted. He provided protection and security. He, uh, he carved out this wine press. And he did this, he did this simply to help them to work. He gave them a job. He gave them responsibility. Just like, just like Anne had responsibility. She had meaningful work. She had responsibility. But you know, this is not just a lesson about Israel. This is a history lesson of how God's chosen people responded with goodness, or to His goodness with disobedience, isn't it? So it's this disobedience we saw time and time again. God was bringing them out of Egypt and we saw them grumble. He brought them to the land and, and they refused to go in. They wandered through the desert and they continued to grumble. And then they're about to go into the land again and they have another misstep. And we just did this huge study in, in Joshua where we kept seeing them move forward and then they would take two steps back. And they would move forward and take two steps back. And, and so there's always this disobedience. Every time God gives them something new, they have another opportunity to, to disobey. And so it's a history lesson, really, of how God's chosen people responded with disobedience. They knew Jesus was talking about them. They, they, they knew that as he was sharing this story, hey, that sounds familiar. I know this is about Israel. I know this is about how we've responded. Jesus is talking, to, talking about us. And so let's look back at, at Luke 20. It says that, that man planted a vineyard and he let it out to tenants and went into a, another country for a long while. Okay, so the man here represents God, right? And, and the vineyard, we just said, represents Israel. And he entrusted the tenants with the responsibility of looking after it. And the tenants here are, are the religious leaders, right? So the religious leaders are given the responsibility of taking care of God's vineyard. And, and they, look, they didn't create it, did they? 
I mean, God just, there, there are these stories that show how God has done all the work. We just studied in Joshua how God was the one who did all the fighting. God was the one that was doing everything. So they didn't, they didn't earn it. They didn't create it. They didn't own it. But out of love, God has provided them with everything they need. Everything they needed to take good care of it. And he also gave them the freedom to live their lives. He said he went to a far country. Gave them freedom to do what they needed to do. Well, how do we respond? How do we respond to the blessings that God has given us? Do we recognize His goodness and respond with obedience and thanksgiving? Well, well, here's the test. If you want to answer the question, how do we respond to that? Are we willing to give the things back to God that are already His to begin with? Are, are, we, are we ready to give Him back our money? Are, are we ready to give Him back our talents? Are we ready to give Him back our family? All the things that matter to us in life, are we ready? Do we hold them like this or do we hold them like this? That's the real test. Everything belongs to Him. We do talk, Stefan just mentioned that a minute ago. That Psalm 24 says that the earth is His and He made it. Right? Everything in it is His. So everything belongs to Him. So verse 10, looking at verse 10, it says, When the time came, He sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give Him some fruit of the vineyard. Question, does God have the right to demand the fruit from the vineyard? Yeah, yeah, he does. Why? Because he's the owner, right? He's the owner. And he owns everything in it. So, yeah, uh, and, and what is this fruit that he demands? Our, our, our lesson, I think our, our notes were very good uh, this week about this. But the fruit here, it, what is the debt that we owe to God? Well, well, that's our obedience, isn't it? God has done all this for us, and, and we owe it to him then to be obedient. Do we live our lives according to His will? Do, do we obey His word? Now, is this proof that the world's view of God as a demanding tyrant is true? No, no, of course not. Well, we see that all He has done for us... Look, I, we had this discussion at, at the dinner table the other day. This is, this is how things go in my house sometimes. Um, my son had, uh, had, had made um, some bread for a family at our church. And I came in and the, and the house smelled fantastic. And I said, well, who's making bread? And, and, and my son said, oh, I'm, I'm making it. And I said, I can't wait. And he said, well, it's not for you. Um, it's, it's for some friends of ours. Um, I'm doing it because um, my, my friend's mom has been cutting my hair. He won't let his mom cut his hair, but he lets his friend's mom cut his hair. Uh, so anyway, he's making this bread as a thank you, as a gesture of, of thanksgiving. Um, so he, he uh, has made this bread for her. And I said, now listen, uh, did she tell you you had to do that? And he said, no. no. Just kind of looked at me funny. I said, so do you feel obligated to do that? And he said, no. And I said, you know, when God does something for us, when we then are asked to obey him, is that like baking bread? for your friend's mom. And he goes, oh, I see what you're doing here. <laughs> so that's how it goes in my family. But that's really what it's all about. When, when we're thankful, when we truly respond with thanksgiving, we want to do things to please that person, don't we? In, in my son's case, he was doing something to please the person who had been serving him, who had been doing something kind for him. And that's what obeying God is all about. It's not because he's a, he's a, a, a rough and, uh, and, and uh, demanding tyrant. It's because we love him. It's because we're showing thanksgiving for his kindness. But what is man's response? Take a look at, uh, at verse 10. It says, they, look, they took the servant and they beat him and they sent him away empty-handed. Now this word uh, that's, that's uh, translated empty-handed here actually means that not only did they not give him the fruit, but they stole everything that he had with him when he came. They sent him away with nothing. Right? And then it says again, they sent him another ser he sent him them another servant, and they also beat him and treated him shamefully. Now, shamefully, this word means they humiliated him. Most likely what they did was they not only stole everything he had, but they probably stripped him naked as well and sent him back humiliated. It appears in three in, in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And and in Matthew and Mark we see that not only did he sent another and that they killed that one, 
And then he says, with so many others, they, some they beat and some they killed. So we, we see this owner continues to give, send more and more and more servants. And every time they send a servant, he sends a servant to them, they beat him, they kill him, they humiliate him, they, 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 they bring shame to him. This is how they're treating the owner. This is how they're treating his servants. And, and do we see the issue here? It, well, the issue is that the tenants were not acting like managers. They're acting like owners, weren't they? They're, they're treating these servants that are coming as if they're robbers trying to come take their things, right? They're treating these servants like you would if someone was trying to break into your house in, in the middle of the night. Or worse, really. They were treating the servants like robbers. So the good things had become the most important things to them. We value the gifts but we don't value the giver. And we resent any interference. This is the rebellious nature of the human heart, isn't it? We want to be left alone to enjoy the blessings that we have. Well, and who are the servants? So we've been talking about these servants. Who are the servants? Well, these servants are the many prophets sent to help the tenants with the vineyard to ensure a bountiful harvest, right? And we see this extraordinary patience of God uh, in, in, who, is, who is pictured here as the owner, sending one servant after another, one prophet after another, only to have them beaten and ridiculed and humiliated and in some cases killed. So how does the owner respond? What's he going to do? What should he do? What would you do? What would you do if this was how you were being treated as an owner? Well, amazingly, he says, I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. Well, Jesus does something remarkable here. He, he's taken this original story and he's tweaked it a bit. He's actually, he's actually inserted himself into this story. And with this, he answers the question, the original question, who do you think you are? Well, Jesus says, I'm the owner's son. I am the rightful heir. All authority has been given to me. Indeed, Jesus isn't, uh, excuse me, Jesus isn't just repeating or restating that he is the son of God, but he's actually predicting his own murder. Jesus is under no delusions about what's about to happen to him. He says, you know, like the servants, you're going to reject me. Like the servants, you're going to humiliate me. Uh, like the servants, you're going to beat me. And like the servants, one day, you're going to murder me. And you know, this isn't a case of mistaken identity either. Did you notice that? So when the tenants see the son coming, they don't think of him as another servant. They say, look, here comes the heir. Their plan is to take the one who will in inherit the vineyard and kill him, get him out of the way so that they can take full ownership. The religious leaders knew exactly who Jesus was too, didn't they? I mean, if you go back and read the events leading up to this conflict, you will see that they, they had acknowledged themselves that he spoke and acted like one who had authority. So they knew who he was, but they wanted to kill him because he was a threat to their very way of life. And Jesus continues, look at verse 15. And they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. You know, I think this story is designed so that you and I, anyone who listens to this story, would immediately, within them, would well up this righteous anger. Who would treat the owner that way? Who would treat the servants that way? Who would treat the owner's son like that? And the question is, what, what would the owner do? You know, one day judgment would come. This story says the owner does, in fact, take action. Like the owner, God cannot allow the rebellion to go on forever, can he? So what does the owner of the vineyard do? Well, Jesus declares in, in verse 16, take a look. It says, he will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, surely not. This is unbelievable. This is absolutely unbelievable to them that he would give the vineyard. They knew what he was talking about. He would give the blessing to others. But he looked directly at them. Jesus looked directly at them and he said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. 
You know, Jesus is using words from Psalm 118 here, and He changes the scene from a vineyard to a building. What He's doing is He's describing a construction site where the builders have rejected this huge stone, and it's sitting there in the site, and everyone that walks along stumbles over this stone. They keep stumbling over it. It's so massive that it can't be moved, and it's impossible to avoid. Well, Jesus is like that. You know, you can't avoid Jesus. One day, all of us, all of us, no matter who we are, will have to face the truth. Winston Churchill once remarked about a political opponent of his that occasionally he stumbled over the truth but hastily picked himself up and hurried on as if nothing happened. You know, I, I was reminded as I was doing this study and as I saw this quote of Billy Graham's opening comments from the video that we saw you know, two weeks ago. He said, once you've faced Jesus, once you've heard the gospel, you can never be the same. When you reject the claims of Christ, it's a very serious thing. Even if you receive Him, you will never be the same. The religious leaders didn't want to face the truth, did they? The truth that was standing right before them. They attempted to exercise their authority over the Son, but Jesus was very clear. The, uh, the authority that they were trying to exercise wasn't even rightfully theirs. And one day, on the day when He was resurrected, a new builder came along and He took what had been discarded, what had been rejected, and He turned it into the most important stone of the foundation. This, this is amazing grace, isn't it? The very act of killing Jesus, now you can't reject anybody more than killing them. The very act of killing Jesus became the foundation for our salvation. A man can either reject Jesus and deal with the inevitable judgment that's coming, or they, he can make him the foundation of his life. He leaves no room for a third choice here. The religious leaders had been entrusted with the responsibility of leading his people, delivering to God what was rightfully his, rather, serving, rather than serving as his managers, they thought themselves as owners. They failed to recognize the authority of God. They failed to recognize the goodness of God. They failed to respond to the patience of God. And therefore, they would experience the judgment of God. Forty years after Jesus uttered these words, the temple would be destroyed. But not only that, the message of God's grace would be given to the Gentiles. Well, we know this isn't a story just about Israel. They never are. We know that it has lessons that, are, that have implications for us tonight too, don't, doesn't it? Well, how might our lives be changed as we come face to face with Jesus tonight? Well, first of all, who, who do we think Jesus is? is? Is He just a teacher? Is He just another prophet? Or is He the beloved Son of God? If you're a believer, here tonight. Have you thanked Him for His goodness today? Have you thanked Him for your life, for your family, for your friends, for the community that you've been called to? Have you thanked Him for meaningful work and talents and creativity to be able to accomplish your tasks? Have you thanked Him for His patience? You know, He loved us so much that even when we were fighting to keep Him out of our lives, He sent His Son to do everything necessary to bring us back into the vineyard. Have you thanked Him for that? And is Jesus just another important thing in your life? Is He just another brick in the wall, the fullness of life? Or is He the foundation of your life? C.S. Lewis wrote that Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If true, it's of infinite importance. But one thing it cannot be is moderately important. And Jesus is like that. 
Same thing can be said about him. Jesus must be the cornerstone in your life. You know, if you're not a believer tonight, first of all, thank you for being here tonight. It is so great to have you. We love having you here, and we hope that you'll come back. But if, if you're not a believer tonight, I want you to ask yourself this question. Why did Jesus send his son to die for you? You know, the world is his, and he owns everything in it. The only thing that belongs to you is your sin. Your life is not even your own. The Bible says that without Christ, you're in bondage. You're a slave to sin. But your life has been purchased at great cost with the blood of the beloved Son of God. Don't keep rejecting Him. Don't just stumble over Him and then pick yourself up and go on as if nothing has happened. Make this your night of decision. Choose Jesus to be the cornerstone of your life. You know, it's, it is the night of decision. You, you can do this very simply. It's, it's done with a simple prayer where you just you get on your knees and you talk to God. That's what prayer is. You acknowledge His authority by getting on your knees and just talking to Him and just saying, God, I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry for rejecting you, and I'm ready to turn to you. I'm ready to make you my Savior. I'm ready to make you the cornerstone of my life. So I don't know where you are tonight. I'm hoping that most of us in here, if not all of us, are believers. And if you are a non-believer, I'm hoping that you are ready tonight. And if you do make that decision tonight, give your leader a call. Give your friend a call and tell him. Let them pray with you. It is a joy when a new believer comes into the fold, into the vineyard. Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to be able to spend some time with you here tonight. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you for certainly for all the blessings that you pour into our lives every minute, every day, every year of our life. We thank you for our life. We thank you for people that love us and that we can love. We thank you for our friends, our buddies. We thank you for this Bible study. We thank you for your word. Father, more than anything else, we thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross. We thank you that by dying on a cross, he paid the price that redeemed us, that purchased us out of slavery to sin, that you chose us out of one family and you put us into your family. We thank you that we are redeemed to unity in Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we are sealed for an inheritance that one day we will be able to spend forever and ever in your vineyard with you. Father, I do pray tonight as we leave this place that if there are some men here that... Uh, that don't yet trust you, that haven't made you the cornerstone in their life, that you would give them new eyes to see, Father, that they would be able to recognize your authority, that they would be able to recognize your goodness, that they would be able to appreciate and respond to your patience so that they don't have to experience your judgment. But, Father, that they might enjoy the pleasant planting in your vineyard, that we all might be unified in Christ because of what he's done for us. I pray that tonight. Pray for these men. I pray for safety as we leave this place and go back home to our loved ones. We look forward to another week if you give us that. We thank you for it in advance. We thank you for more opportunities to spend time with each other and in your word, and we look forward to coming back next week. Father, it's in your precious son, Jesus' name, that we pray. Amen.